Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. You know, we have all had a fascination with what the future has in store for us. And one of the most famous seers, you know, that most people are really well familiar with is Michel de Nostradamus, a most commonly known as Nostradamus. He has, you know, predicted, you know, and foretold of many events, everything from Napoleon to World War II with Hitler. Um, even some interpretations have been, um, have led to thinking that even this year, 2022, may be the time that the crown is transferred from the queen to uh, Prince Charles. And, the, and that is in many things he's predicted, you know, the Antichrist, he's gone through all these things. And we have the fortune of having author Vint. Victor Baines here with us. I'm not sure what I was trying to say. Barnes is Victor Baines having him with us here. And he, with his book, remember the future, the prophecies of Nostradamus. And this is a subject I've had a real big fascination with. Um, we have Mark Eddy joining us as well. Um, so this is going to be an exciting one, exciting one. If I may be so bold as to predict myself. So right now, Nostradamus, the prophecies is right now. <laughs> Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name's Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. Chris, what's going on, man? We're back. We're back. Yes, it was a. Yeah, Austin's still out. Um, you know, his, I think the kids aren't feeling good, so you know, he lied to everybody. He said he was going to be back today. He lied. Yeah, he's not back. Yeah, the ginger porn stash is not with us today. It's just us two, uh, two beards. But luckily, luckily, the guest that's on it, he has a beard to fill in. And Mark, he's just one of these times. We're just going to have to get him a little stick. Where I just, you know, he can just hold it up just to show that he has a beard. Because it's just, besides his best effort, it's just like the Kung Fu Chinaman. That's the, the, you know, that's what he can pretty much grow. He just has those two wispy hairs. <laughs> so, Mark, how are you, sir? I, I'm fine. I, I'm really looking forward to tonight's show. Oh, yeah. This is going to be a lot of fun. Talk, um, talking Nostradamus. And at this time, let's bring on the, the guest, Victor Baines, who I tried to say was last name was Barnes. But that was, you know, so I'm not sure where that, that came from. But how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good. And yeah, I brought my beard to the show. So yeah. you're still the three beards. That's right. We got the th three, th yep, three beards. That's one of we have to. We just have to get it just the stick, you know, Mark. Just... <laughs> 3.25 beards. How about that? Yeah. yeah, that'll be like every time, like the buzz in to talk, the beard's up. And he's just, it's like, Mark, yes. And like raise his hand. There you go. But, yeah, so Mark's got the copy of the book. Mine's still being shipped somewhere from it through the magic that is Amazon. Okay. Um, so that's um, we could see it here. I'm going to bring up a pic picture here too for it. See, so, there, yeah, you got a sticky note on the front there, but yeah, it's, it's from the yeah. library. Oh, really? Okay, but they they had a copy of it there, so it, it's. Um, I think yeah, it, have a terrific book if you you know, are looking to understand the prophecies, you, you have it outlined in, you know, uh, 
Ta-da. Re- a readable uh, format. Uh, it makes it easy to comprehend. You know, di- different subjects. Now, is there a difference between the covers? Because I've seen some show it like yellow, and other ones are white. Is that yeah. a different uh, edition? That's an Amazon. Uh, we, we, that's, that's the ebook version there. They, they okay. like to make it bright and colorful. So the actual yeah, print so is. edition is white, correct? Okay. Yeah. That's it's, the difference. Yeah. So I was I was just curious about about that because I saw the two. So that you know that that makes sense why there's a difference. So gotcha. Yep. Got five out of five stars stars on it. So that's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. Good. So I and it's this one for me. One of the biggest questions, I mean, it seems it seems like, you know, really cliche, um, especially on this one, is for you, what got you into the fascination, you know, with Nostradamus and his prophecies? And what got you to this point where I feel like I need to write a book about this? Okay. Uh, I was at, I'm a drummer, and our band was, repa- was rehearsing at a friend of mine's uh, little studio behind his house. And uh, the band took a break, and we went into the guy's house, you know, to drink some water, smoke a cigarette, chill for a few minutes. I think it was on HBO, uh, a movie called uh, Nostradamus, The Man Who Saw Tomorrow came on. And, you know, I thought I was pretty uh, pretty aware of most hip stuff that was happening back then in the 80s. But for some reason, I'd never heard of Nostradamus. I'm amazed that I hadn't heard of him before that. So I was just kind of captivated by everything all the different areas of the subject matter that they were discussing. And uh, I went out and bought some books on him, did a little research, but I didn't start writing until about 1990. Well, uh, our, my band had just broke up and something just said, man, you, you need to do something different. I thought, you know, I'd like to write a book. And if I could sit here and write little verses, you know, to write a song, writing a book is just doing the same thing, but over and over and over again. So I sort of applied my learn from music and, and put that into uh, my writing activities. The first book I wrote was a book about dreams and the subject of dreams called The Dream Diary. But then uh, I thought, man, I just want to write this. I just felt really like the universe just compelled me to want to write a book about Nostradamus. And all my friends go, man, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. And you know what? It turned out to be about the smartest thing I've ever done. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And it's just, I put up on the screen here too. You can find more information for you. I've got it on the ticker down there is it, you can visit Nostradamususa.com. Um, and this, this is the Nostradamus society of America. Now, is this a society that people can join up with you or is this yes, something it's, where it's just yeah, kind of we're name a very loosely organized uh, organization? I mean, we're just, uh, we are a, a, uh, an internet historical society. You can, you can, uh, Join. You can log on and fill out the form. And uh, I've been procrastinating a little bit on a, on a mass newsletter, but that'll be coming up in the next month or so. But yeah, and people can ask me any questions they want to. You know, they can fill out the comments, ask me questions. I'm here for everybody. There's also merchandise. You can support them through the merchandise shop there. there and so go. we've got a little merch there. That's great. Yeah, well, I do like the shirt. I do like the shirt. That's that's pretty cool. And then. You've also got um, to under your belt. You have, you're you've got a little bit of TV, you know, fame behind you. You've been on a couple of programs. Um, Is it real? Decoded and the Nostradamus effect. Yes, uh, yeah, I like the Nostradamus effect series. And yeah, I did my first show for the Discovery Channel, and the last show I've done is for the Discovery Channel Plus. I enjoy doing most of those shows now and then. They, they kind of twist things around a little bit, do things that you didn't really think they would. But overall, I'm, I'm rather pleased with most of those productions. Yeah, the, and I was, I was just going to, you know, you kind of, my next question was like, which one was your favorite? And you already said. <laughs> so you already, yeah, you already got ahead of your mind. Yeah, that's right. So out of the one, um, we'll just get right to the kind of the juicy part. What is your go-to? Like, you know, everybody's got that part, like what you like to reread. I mean, I've got... I said, I'm still waiting on your book. I've got, I'm not going to, I'm not going to advertise for the other guy. I have books on Nostradamus, you know, so I've read and everybody's got like some of their favorite ones. Like, um, okay. Well, you know, so I, what, yeah. So what for you, what is one of your favorite ones that you like? Like, you know, it's like, you kind of get that feeling, you know, it's like, oh my God, that's amazing how accurate this was. 
Well, well, I'll say what I was really drawn to uh, in the beginning and still I'm curious about is uh, this third Antichrist of the future. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out who that might be, where they come from, what's going to happen. I'm really drawn to that. Uh, the earthquakes uh, in America, there's another subject I'm, I'm interested in. And, you know, just... Uh, I kind of look at it from a patriotic viewpoint, like uh, what's going to happen to our country, you know, in the future or what could happen to us and what's going to happen in different countries around the world in the future. And, you know, Nostradamus being a Frenchman, that's kind of the center of his world. And most of, uh, most of his predictions deal with Europe, but it also deals with, with other places, mostly north of the equator. That's where most human activity happens is in the, the mm -hmm. northern sphere of the world but uh uh i'm kind of drawn to all the different subject matters but especially the ones that, that deal with war earthquakes and future disasters what, what i found what i found very intriguing um i'm still like i said like we said we're still waiting on the book what i found very intriguing is that people from the newer era and uh, the 80s and the 70s they don't like to give nobody any credit they said well, maybe he just wrote all this stuff and he, it just just generalized it. So when something happens, people equate uh, equate back to it. Like, no, yeah, that's that, that, that's kind of the argument that uh, so-called skeptics use. It's like, oh, you're going to make a prediction. Well, make it real general. Don't give it a specific time, and probably that'll work out or whatever. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. That's not how it works. And you know, if you want to. If you get pulled over by the police, say you're driving down the road at 12 o'clock, maybe you had a drink or two, a policeman is going to judge uh, your lucidity level by hearing you talk, okay? Uh -huh. Okay, well, if you're uh, somebody and you want to see uh, how smart somebody is, read their writing. Look at their sentence structure, what they, uh, uh, their punctuation or whatever. You can judge someone's IQ level. If you look at Nostradamus' book, you look through it, just his writing style alone and his subject matter makes him a genius. Then you add to that his mystical knowledge and writing things about the future. The guy was smart. The guy had it down. But uh, some things are kind of coded, and you have to kind of read the information a lot to understand the little uh, uh, codes that he uses. But uh, overall, man, it's like uh, he's made so many predictions that are right on. It's crazy. But uh, he, he coded it to where if you're a believer, you can kind of see what you're looking for. If you're a doubter, you might not be able to see certain stuff. So it really depends mm -hmm. on the opinions and the intelligence level of uh, the readers as to whether they want to believe it or not. Well, uh, uh, yeah. The, the, uh, Craig, may I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, jump right in. I didn't want to inter interrupt you. Oh, no. Uh, uh, Victor, you were talking about uh, you know, these general terms, uh, you know, they're coded, you know, skeptics, and uh, you know, make that claim. Uh, but Nostradamus does say in Century 10, uh, Quatrain 79, yeah, he does mention modern Memphis. Okay. So, uh, and okay, let me tell you about that one. I got, I got, I got the explanation for you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, whenever I was writing my book, uh, I did a lot of research. Like I would speak to people at NASA. Uh, I, I'll call the USGS to talk to the U S Navy to try to get some videos from them, my website and stuff. And anyway, uh, you know, you really have to have thick skin to look through some of these prophecies because, we're talking about revolutions, mass murder, uh, you know, uh, earthquakes, uh, maybe a asteroid hitting the earth. So you have to be kind of thick skin. But anyway, long story short, when I called the USGS, I spoke to their to their uh, spokesman, uh, you know, who does public affairs work. And by the time I got through talking to that guy, the hair on my neck was like standing up. This guy spooked me out. Uh, and, and it was about that modern Memphis 1079 quatrain. Uh, people think, oh, earthquake zones in America. The first thing you think about is the West Coast. Okay. When things, oh, you know, from Southern California up to Washington State, 
Those are the most active fault lines. Well, as it turns out, there's something called uh, the New Madrid or New Madrid, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I like to call it the New Madrid fault line. And that is in the center of the country. It's in Arkansas, Missouri, uh, Tennessee, and Illinois. And like, I think it was like 1813 uh, or so, they had an earthquake there that was so powerful at that time, there were only like, you know, fur trappers and pioneers in that part of the country. But the pioneers, you know, kind of the Daniel Boone type said that the ground looked like the ocean. It was, you know, uh, just moving. The earth was moving like water does in the sea. And it was a huge earthquake. They felt it in Washington, D.C., hundreds of miles away. It actually reversed the tide of the Mississippi for something like three or four years. Anyway, so... Whereas uh, uh, buildings in California are built to uh, earth earthquake specs, you know they have to like mm -hmm. lean, you know, move back a little bit. Here in the center of, a, of our country, in these quasi rural areas, we don't have any infrastructure built like that. And the USGS predicted that probably ten years ago uh, an earthquake should have happened in that area, but it hasn't happened yet. But long story short. I think Nostradamus is definitely referencing the New Madrid fault line. And, you know, I don't want to see any earthquake happen. I don't want to see anybody get killed or any buildings collapse. But if that does happen, uh, you talk about mega death. There's going to be a, a black hole in the central part of our country if that happens. And, uh, you know, I don't really know what they could do to, you know, hopefully uh, prepare for that or plan for that. Or, you know, if they can see it coming, allow people to leave or whatever. But thinking about it, if, if a big, huge area just gets torn to shit for hundreds of miles uh, every direction, there are not going to be any roads for tr fire trucks or ambulances to come into. Uh, airplanes can't land. I guess maybe helicopters could. But long story short, if that happens, it could be the biggest mess that our country has ever faced. And it can mm -hmm. take decades to repair. So I, I look at all the worst case scenarios and work backwards. But I figure if I sense something that looks like a disaster, it's my duty as an author to explain that. You know, I'm just one guy, six foot two. But people in power, if you can get that message to them, maybe they can do something to prevent it, you know, or, or help to uh, to mitigate all the uh, damages that could happen from it. Yeah, that's and there were several of, you know. Oh, like, let me say this real quick. Oh, no, here in Florida, they told me, USGS told me that Texas and Florida – uh, are the most immune from earthquakes. If you live in Texas or Florida, you're in pretty safe turf. Yeah, right on. <laughs> That's like, yes, uh, West Virginia. Oh man, you know, Mark, Mark, you got to move. You got to get, got to get. You know, you're you're in cold country. Come on, come on. Got to get down here to the sunshine. Yes, uh, I, 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 I could use it. It's been a little uh, too cold and damp. Uh, in the Pittsburgh area. So being in the sunshine uh, w would be much appreciated. Look, let me throw in something else about earthquakes real quick. Mm -hmm. yeah, Another uh, uh, bad area for our country is the uh, caldera up there in Yellowstone park. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now uh, they kind of been waiting for that one to go too, but uh, I don't think that it, that it is, or it's not anytime soon, but if that one goes off, it could put out so much stuff into the atmosphere that uh, it would it would fill the whole atmosphere with sulfuric acid to the point that about a thousand miles every direction it can kill everything. It might even be able if it was big enough to bring down about half the Earth. So that's a real serious caldera up there. You know, cross your fingers. Hopefully, it'll never happen. But, yeah, because you know a couple of his quatrains. I think it was. I think it was, you know, I'm trying to remember the numbers on him. I want to say it was like 816 and like, you know, 117 is ones where he he had a lot that revolved around ecological disasters hmm. and where he was, he was seeing that. Yep. And that's, um, and that was kind of like the same thing because we just had, um, he's watching the show right now, Brian, about, and he put it out there, there was an earthquake in the Northeast that just happened. It was like a 2.3. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, just someplace where there's not, you know, there's right. not earthquake activity, and we just had one there. Well, we have a very dynamic Earth, and, you know, we kind of take for granted, you know, that uh, 
wherever you drive, it's going to be flat. You're going up a hill, that's going to be there, blah, blah, blah. But really, it's just an illusion. I mean, the Earth is a huge molten ball of nickel and iron. And just about a 30 uh, miles uh, from the surface downward is, you know, what we live on. So we don't really get the picture that we are. If you can look down with special glasses and see what's underneath the ground, it's nothing but molten nickel and iron. And here we are, this little ball going around uh, this fiery ball. And over here is this, over here is this, blah, blah, blah. We're all in a little round spaceship going in a ride through space every day. And we never look at it that way, but that's the physical reality of our existence. Yeah, it's 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 quite amazing, you know, just, it just how amazing. yeah, just the, the everything that had to come together for this to have occurred. Uh that's you know, and that was one of the things that fascinated. I mean, I don't know if it's morbid curiosity. It's you know, growing up when I'd go to church, I always read Revelations. Okay. You know, that was always, you know, it didn't care what the preacher was talking about. You know, the yeah. pastor was talking up there. I'm reading Revelations, you know, because that's, you know, who who doesn't like a good old, you know, apocalypse story, you know, yes. of the horsemen and stuff. And then, you know, I discovered Nos- Nostradamus and, you know, here you have those ones. I mean, like, I think one of mine, like I'd asked you about, you know, cause we talked a little bit, you know, we'll get to the Antichrist. But I also, one of my favorite ones um, was about the Philosopher's Stone. And okay. that's, you know, about the discovery of that. And I think, and one of the ones, I think it was sometime about, about now, somewhere between like the prediction was sometime in the, in our current state, like 20, in the 2020s, that this might be discovered. And that's, that's something where kind of with everything that's going on, all, all of the base, basically the A, the AI systems, the artificial, you know, like what Bill Gates just announced artificial breast milk. You know, oh, well, <laughs> you know, and then you have this type, you know, so I'm like, it's like, the, there we go, the Philosopher's Stone. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, talking talk about the Antichrist, you, you mentioned, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, it's like if you look at this war in Ukraine with Putin, I'm starting to get the idea. I think that Putin is uh, under under satanic control. You read, you hear all these people as the war start off, there's like, well, I knew Vladimir Putin, and he was this kind of personality. Oh, I knew Putin had this kind of personality. And everyone's going, he's changed. What's changed with him? I think he, I think Satan has come up from the ethers and grabbed that guy by the head. You look at what he's doing, the Russians are doing in that war in Ukraine. It's not a gentleman's war. It's like everything is backwards. This total, unmerciful, harsh, barbaric murder and death. And it's like, Man, you're you're a pretty good candidate for the third Antichrist, Mister Putin. I think probably the third Antichrist is going to be from China, but uh, that's some evil stuff going on over there. And I see how evil that is, and I'm just thinking, I think Satan had Hitler by the balls for a while. And I think Satan's got got Putin by the balls. If you believe in the God, the devil, and all that stuff, which I do, uh, that's a pretty good example of of uh, some Antichrist <laughs> behavior on a large scale. Well, so if you take the Bible, if you take, you know, like, so a lot of it points to, you know, the armies of the East, you know, coming together. Exactly. And that's, and that's what, you know, we kind of, like you were saying, we're kind of looking at right now, Russia is trying to flex, you know, flex themselves. And the as same with China, they're trying to flex their domination, you know, over the Pacific area. Yeah. And so, in the, so in those can, so you could actually kind of see, I mean, you know, logically, like we try to fill the pieces. This yeah. looks like that's the massive million, you know, man army from the from the east that will march where the Armageddon battle in the where they say I think it's a modern day, you know, like ancient Persia, but modern day Iran, Iraq. It's, it is where the the thought is Armageddon. But I, what do you think? Do you think that's the location, or do you think that's well, just I still? Think, uh, that's if you want to look at the biblical view, uh, I think uh, Israel. There's the Gog and Magog theme, or whatever. Uh, I think there's one quad train that talks about, uh, maybe it's an epistle, uh, like an invasion, uh, like Israel being attacked from all directions. And it specifically says that a, a military fleet from the West will come, uh, to rescue Israel if that happens. Uh, you know, they're, they're fighting, uh, a proxy war with, with Iran and, uh, uh, in Syria. And, yep. uh, I, I think, uh, 
a Russian submarine just fired some missiles at some Israeli planes the other day. So, uh, you know, things are heating up over there. Things are kind of heating up everywhere. And with this, this war in Ukraine, it's put everybody into a, you know, a, kind of a new posture of looking out, seeing what's going on. And boy, the whole world, oh, Putin had really underestimated what was going to happen there uh, with uh, Ukraine. And I think we are chewing him, chewing off his legs pretty good right now. I think we're going to chew off even more. I yeah, think Brian. it's really cool that they blew up that, that flagship of the Black Sea. It's like, right on, man. Show yeah. everybody hates an invader, you know. Well, that's what, you know, just Brian brought up a good point, too, is that the Antichrist is going to be a beloved character. They won't be hated. They will be actually, you know, they're going to be, I mean, just like it is, they're going to be the false prophet, the one that people actually gravitate to and follow. You know, that's, that's more of a biblical view, a uh, mm -hmm. Nostradamus view. I mean, to be an Antichrist is basically someone who uh, thinks and acts the opposite of the way that Christ would be. It, it, Antichristos, it comes from Greek. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, just like, uh, look at everything Hitler did. I mean, that's about as Antichrist as it can get. Napoleon, you know, uh, uh, you know, France loved Napoleon. Oh, so everybody loves, like the Germans love Hitler. Man, you're you're the you're the greatest thing ever. Uh, the <laughs> French love Napoleon. Man, you're the greatest thing ever. So I think the Antichrist might be loved in their own country, but to the rest of the world, they're going to say that to them. You know what I'm saying? So it's all point of view. So, yeah. So I had a question. Um, this is on topic, but it just is going a different direction. Did you okay. do you think do you think Notre Dame was a time traveler because? There's no possible way he could have uh, predicted uh, AI and a guy like Elon Musk. I don't know if he's actually talking about Elon, but he's like a guy will come and be like a invader or whatever. I mean, do you think he had some um, time travel abilities? Because prophets now can only see a little bit. They're, they can't. Well, see this way, with astrology, it's like uh, kind of a, a quick uh, explanation of astrology, you know, where did astrology come from? Blah, blah, blah. Why does it exist? These days, a lot of people don't really have a, a good understanding of astrology or where it comes from other than, hey, I'm a Sagittarius, so what does the newspaper say for me? Anyway, uh, astrology took thousands of years to develop. And it's kind of like, you know, before there was TV, uh, at nighttime, it was the theater of the sky. You go outside the dark, you look at the stars, you look at the moon. See how things are moving around. And ancient people discovered, hey, whenever these planets are over here, uh, when it's cold, that means 30 days after that, you need to plant the corn. And if you don't plant the corn at the right time, your tribe's going to die. You know what I'm saying? So they, they noticed the cycles of nature, and they had to develop a, a, a system to figure out how to survive based on looking at the stars and the sun and the moon and all that. But anyway... Right now, we're living in what's called the age of Pisces, which is defined as, dig this, man killing his fellow man in an attempt to define God. And if you look around the planet, it's like that's kind of what's happening. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Gandhi said, all religions point towards God. But we got like one group of people that have this name for God over here. We got another group of people that have a different name for God. And because they're different religions, Although they both believe in a God, here they are wasting their time killing each other because they have a different definition of a spiritual system and what God is and everything. But anyway, with astrology, so uh, the age of Aquarius is next. If you've ever heard that song from the 60s, the dawning mm -hmm. of the age of Aquarius, that's what's yep. coming next. And that's going to be uh, a, a better uh, era in time to live through. But anyway, through astrology, you can go far into the future making predictions. But I think maybe uh, one of the things, and, you know, you got to bear in mind, back in Nostradamus' time, the 1500s, they still had these mystical books of knowledge, okay? Maybe some of them kind of dark arts, some of them white magic, you know, uh, different things. But over the last few hundred years or whatever, the Catholic Church, for their own protection of that, back in that era of time, would get those books and burn them. Because, you know, if, it doesn't, if a book didn't scream Jesus, that means throw that in the fire and burn it because people don't need to see it. So he had some very uh, advanced mystical knowledge to work from. 
But uh, there's also ways to make uh, like a cosmic connection with uh, with angels or spirits on the other side. And I think maybe that's sort of an under under uh, estimated or a not known way that he may have predicted the future. And if you can connect uh, uh, with the spirit world uh, on the good side, not the dark side, uh, angels, they can see the future. So I think uh, that maybe uh, he knew how to tap into the angelic realm. If you don't believe in God, then you can then, well, that's crazy. If you do believe in God, then you have to say that might be possible. Okay. Oh. I mean, that, that's a different take on it. Was just as you were talking about that, it made me think about that. I don't know. Have you ever heard of, I'm trying to, let me skip that name, the phantom time hypothesis? hypothesis? No. It's where the dark ages didn't exist. That that was actually that that was something that was you know that's basically been missing time, that the time like all of our our time frame is actually off by almost okay. three hundred years, and so this was one where basically it was that it was if I remember the whole basis of it it was it was pretty much like the the Vatican secret archives like all this information was just basically taken away it wasn't that we just suddenly forgot everything it's just this knowledge was just locked you know something locked it away. And then you just went through this whole period, and it's a, okay. it was just kind of like the time time frame. It's a, yeah, so it's really so as you were talking about, it, I was just saying it's it's really interesting because it ha- it happened right right about I think I think it was eighty six fourteen nine and to nine eleven is somewhere around, it was about that time frame. You know, I hear seven. a lot of uh, as time goes on, like oh, I see stuff on the internet. Oh. Uh, oh, the time traveler. Uh, he came from 200 years to the future, and here he is walking down the street saying, oh, I don't believe that bullshit. I mean, that, that's just somebody, <laughs> a desperate yep. writer coming up with something stupid to write about as sucker bait, okay? <laughs> but uh, like you're talking about when you went to Sunday school as a kid, it was preachers all, revelations, revelations. Yep. Well, I, I grew up as a Catholic, and I remember going to Sunday school and the priest explaining to us that, Yes, there is, you know, heaven and there's hell and there's God and the devil. And kind of the surface of the earth was sort of a, a war between the forces of good and evil. I just kind of remember that sticking in my head. And I think there may be something to that. It's kind of like you see, you know, this battle of good over evil. You know, maybe that's just a point of view, uh, who's good and who's evil. But we see that struggle happening all the time. And uh, it's kind of like all this weird karma if there is a God and the devil, are human beings just kind of uh, little puppets of the gods? You know what I'm saying? Are they mm-hmm. kind of controlling our actions? Uh, uh, what's going on here exactly? And everyone's got their own opinion about it. But uh, you see that happening every day. And now that we see kind of the rise of evil. And here we are, our country fighting it through proxies or whatever. Uh, that's kind of coming more uh, relevant in our daily lives. and. You know, it's kind of scary. I mean, to me, you think, why do all these countries waste all this time, energy, and money wanting to butt heads and have wars with each other? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to, like, you know, forget wars? Instead of spending half your gross domestic product buying weapon systems, could you feed the people, you know, give them insurance, give them health care, uh, spend it on good things instead of killing each other? I mean, it just seems like a real waste of time. However, yeah. here we are, and in a way, we think, oh, we're all technically advanced. We're we're so ahead here in, you know, science and technology and everything. And really, uh, human beings are basically nothing more than a, a bunch of monkeys wearing a three-piece suit. I mean, uh, how evolved are we, really? Yeah, I wish I could attribute the the quote. I'm just, it's that one, for as long as there's been belief in gods, you know, it's, they've basically, that's been the reason to kill each other. You know, everybody's done that in the name of God, you know, so it's just religion has always just been, it's been one of the main drives of war. That seems like, yeah, that's, that's, that's religion uh, being used in a bad way. Yeah. And it's, and I, that for me, no, like the prophecies like Nostradamus, I never really, you know, get, kind of, you know, give me your take on this too, but it's, I never actually took them as this is guaranteed to happen. These were a lot of ones like, this is something where if we continue on this path, this is what will occur. 
some yeah, of these the things. Yeah, I look at that. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's the way uh, you would end. That'd be like the last statement you would hear in a Nostradamus movie, kind of like, "Well, we're going to be all optimistic here. Maybe it's that way. Maybe it's yeah. that way. Blah blah blah." But no, he really says in his book, like what I'm saying here, that's what's going to happen. Now, whether we can figure out what he's saying or not is another story. But he's saying, yes, what I'm telling you is going to happen. You know, whether you can figure it out or not is up to you. Of course, everybody hates bad news. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to look at it. We have people in government. Their job is to look at the bad news. But, yeah, I mean, there's there's really not a whole lot of great news uh, in the prophecies of Nostradamus other than if you can get a warning, get an idea about something bad that's going to happen, then somebody telling you, giving you a message about what what bad things are going to happen ends up being uh, good news for you because hopefully you can do something to try to mitigate it, avoid it, and you know not have it happen. Or if it does happen, how do you whip its ass and make it go away? You know. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. That's kind of, kind of what it was. It's just you know, like the ecological ones, it doesn't look like there's much of a way out of those. Obviously, a meteor strike, you know, is going to be meteor you know, strike no matter what. I mean. I, I was doing research for that Discovery Plus series uh, whenever COVID hit, and you know, uh, actually, it's one of the one of the British production people I was working with found a prophecy that I had overlooked, and it talks about uh, uh, a big ball. Uh, I think it's called uh, twelve stades in diameter hitting the Earth, and a stade is a Roman u- unit of measurement from thousands of years ago. So that's something like a uh, six mile in diameter ball coming from space and hitting the earth. And Nostradamus talks about a, a time when there's going to be a huge flood, gl- huge global flood. And at first they used to think, well, you know, global warming is real. The polar regions melt. That could start a global flood. Uh, and then, but then learning more about asteroids, uh, I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, maybe the next century. But if an asteroid that big hits the Earth, uh, we're going to be screwed for a long time. I mean, you talk about mega death, that will change everything. And yeah. uh, there's not a damn thing we can do about it that I know of right now, you know, unless they got some spaceship they're going to develop with a, like you see in the movies, how to blow up an asteroid in space. Well, it's, anyway, it's sad, but we've only got a couple more years before we can use Bruce Willis. You know, we're gonna, right. you know, we're we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose him. You know, all jokes aside, you know, he's he's gonna lose the ability to save us from the asteroid here a little bit. So we, if it's gonna happen, it's got to happen now, or we're gonna have to find an alternative. So our human egos want us to think, you know, hey, you know, life's wonderful. Uh, you know, let's go to the movies. Let's go have a steak dinner. Blah blah blah. Everything's great. Nobody really wants to focus on the bad stuff that could happen, but yeah, you know, yeah. someone's got to do it. Uh, uh, Vic, Victor, you you know we were just talking about it, uh, some of these things could happen, but um, you know the I ju- you know just uh, showed the camera towards the beginning of the show about modern Memphis. Okay, yeah. uh, that was something that happened. Or, or, uh, like Memphis, Tennessee was founded, you know, maybe about 300, 250, 300 years after uh, Nostradamus' life. Uh, but he, he was pretty concrete about history. Uh, and he, you, know, you also uh, cover in, in your book... Um, uh, the catastrophic events around 3797 AD. Okay. In uh, the epistle, uh, which is there's quatrains as the main uh, body of Nostradamus's, uh, the prophetees. Uh, there's a preface and then there's an epistle too at the end. Okay. And in the epistle, he kind of goes through uh, a couple paragraphs that talk about, uh, floods and then asteroids coming in and uh basically long story short he's saying that the the physical end of the earth uh would be 3797 due to burning stones from the heavens bombarding the earth 
Okay, so we got the Oort belt out there. There's comets, you know, flying around mm-hmm. out there. You know, if NASA might be able to uh, see the patterns of some of these uh, uh, asteroids, or you know, sometimes we don't even see asteroids coming; they come past us anyway. There could be like uh, the Death Star of an asteroid out there somewhere. If you could take, if they know the, if they knew the directions and trajectories of all these asteroids. Uh, they might be able to use a telescope to see what the Death Star is going to be that blows us up someday. But long story short, you know, I'm not going to be around in 3797. But if I am, it's not going to be in this body. It'll be in yeah. another one. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hold them to it as being accurate. But long story short, that gives us about, what, uh, 1,700 more years of life on this planet. And, hey, if we even make it that long... There ain't going to be much of the earth left, you know, between now and then, between people struggling to eat and, you know, build structures to live in and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we are we are destroying this planet at an amazing rate right now, especially in the ocean. There's so many little tiny particles of plastic floating around in the ocean. These fish eat them and it kills the fish and it pollutes everything. I mean, we got to take a real, we got to separate corporate greed and corporate profit and what men want to do for their own personal greed and say, hey, look, we got to do this for the good of the planet. You might make a little yeah. bit less money doing what's right, but if you keep doing things incorrectly, uh, how, who cares about making money if everyone's dead and are half dead and there's no money to make? You know, that I makes mean, sense. We, yeah, we got to get it together, man, and have a collective view of how to survive here because the population is increasing. And the scarcity of products and services is more. So, you know, it's a crazy world out there. We're all kind of victims of international corporate greed. You know, they're, they're like uh, our shepherd and we're their sheep. Come screw the corporation. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's ones. I mean, you've heard of like the great, you know, the great Pacific garbage patch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's like, that's yeah. out there. It, there's cer- yeah there's several there's several locations where it's just it's like all this debris that gets brought out to the ocean just kind of circulates yeah. and just stays and there's people yeah. that are yeah it's it's there's i mean i could bring up an image you know for anybody that's not sure what's going going on and they can see hey, we can all buy boats and kind of go up there and hook them up together we'll be the boat people of the pacific and live in a garbage patch how about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, and this is this is kind of, this is one of the images of it. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's my idea of a beautiful view of the ocean. Yep, and it's just it's, wow. you know, and there's just several there's several locations like this where it just it seems to just all accumulate, and yeah. it's why, why, pretty. Why can't they make a paper or cardboard container instead of a plastic one that can be recycled? Because it doesn't last as long. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's and you no, know, talking about greed, it's like I guess to operate any business, you have to have some greed, some level of greed to make profit, and that's okay. But you know, I'm just noticing life if you get too greedy doing anything, that's where you screw yourself and it becomes bad karma. So there's a fine yeah. line between being a little bit greedy and making things work, and then being overly greedy and screwing everything up. And I think we're now where the corporate world is just pushing their greed a little too far. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember in like quadrants. I was trying to look it up as um, as you guys were talking about that one. I I want to say that there was some that he he had a couple on ecological disasters, but I don't know if he ever ever foresaw something kind of like that Great Pacific Garbage Patch or anything like that per se. I mean, I know we saw saw a lot of floods. Like yes. one of them, I think he predicted the 2005 New Orleans. You know, I did disaster. find a quad train. Yeah, I, I don't remember the number of it. Uh, he did kind of nail that one. I didn't realize that one was there. Uh, I, that up, I, I went back and did some research. He talked about brackish water, which uh, Louisiana, I don't know if you've ever been there. There's a whole lot of, you know, areas where the sea, ocean water meets the fresh water. There's brackish water around. Everything. 384 is this. Um, Okay. Three dash eighty four, the quatrain, and that was one. Um, the great city will be laid to waste. 
not even one inhabitant will remain. Walls, women, churches, and virgins are violated. People will die by knife, fire, plague, and gunshot. I don't think that applies to the New Orleans thing. I know what you're talking about, though. But yeah, yeah. I mean, at one point, there's a war coming up where it's like, probably if we have a nuclear exchange sometime, of people like digging down in the dirt, finding roots of plants to eat, and people being so hungry that they pull babies from the mama's breast and throw them against the wall and cook them and eat them or something like that. I mean, I know that's really horrible sounding stuff. Yeah. But what if there was a nuclear war one day? What if uh, one nuke goes off? If one nuke goes off anywhere in the world, as long as it's, you know, not a little teeny one, it's going to change everything. I mean, yep. stock markets will go whew, down to nothing instantly like that. And then, you know, people are going to have to eat, get water and all that. I mean, the lack of water is going to be a big thing coming up. Right now, the... Uh, the, the glaciers and ice caps up in the Himalayas, global warming is making them smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, the Himalayas, as you know, is a huge mountain range. And there's something like a hundred, several hundred mil, bil, several hundred million people in Asia get their water supply from the Himalayan ice melting every year and coming down, you know, turning into water and then drinking it. Well, if everything warms up and there are no ice caps up there, uh, where are you going to get your water from? I mean, you can yeah. live a long time or many days without food, but you can only go like two or three days without water. So I tell anybody, you know, go to the store, buy, spend 20 or $30, as much water as you can, put it in your closet. Because if something bad happens or the Russians or terrorists shut down the grid and you turn on the water faucet and no water comes out, People be killing each other in the street for a glass of water. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and this, yeah, it's one of those like desalinization plants. You know, it's like why has has this not become more of a focus? There you go. That is well, probably going to be a big major focus in the future. Yeah, and and, and Victor, you cover that uh, uh, poisoned water supplies. Oh no, that was that's a quad train. I think uh, dealing with New York, where he talks about yeah. waters being poisoned by sulfur. I think yeah. that was. Uh, we, I looked at that from a literal viewpoint and I found out that you can't really sulfur, can't really uh, get in the water supply or what. I think that is an alchemistic uh, sulfur uh, is used in alchemy uh, to mean a certain thing. And that, that's him kind of being the, uh, the poet and not really uh, so much the prophet. And some of these quatrains, uh, there's a, quatrains are four lines, okay? Some of them like maybe the first line or a third line might be kind of poetic fluff followed by the real information. Okay. And he says he codes these. Uh, so uh, uh, the average idiot can't figure it out, but he says people of good intelligence can figure out what I'm saying here. So he kind of disguises it. He said he could have even timed all these, but you know, if you were a, if you were a prophet, you could see the future and you said, Oh, a guy named Adolf Hitler is going to come along. This is going to happen. A guy named Napoleon Bonaparte is going to come along. It's going to come along. And this is going to happen. It would screw everything up. So he had kind of had to code things a little bit to camouflage them. So I think that's what that's what that sulfur, the sulfur water is being poisoned by sulfur. I think that's what he's referring to there. Unless maybe it could be subsurface lava and sulfuric acid and stuff, maybe going into a water table. You know, that's another thing. We drill holes into the earth to get water. Well, when do we finally suck all the water out of the earth? I mean, I guess there's only a, a limited quantity down there. You know, but anyway, this water conservation and our ability to get water is going to be really important in the next 30 or 40 years. I think in the western U.S., Nevada, Arizona, California, there's a great shortage of water already. So you're right, man. It's going to be a problem. And then do you, um, you know, some of the research, like some of the quadrant, they, they attest it to the current, the current situation with the queen, you know, like the queen, like this year, you know, one of them, they attested that the queen might, um, might pass away. So putting the crown to Prince Charles. And I think if I remember right, which one that was, was 672. 
Okay, I'm not really was, familiar with that. Like I say, unfortunately, we're yeah. all gonna we're all gonna yeah, pass was, away one day, whether we're a peasant or a queen or a king. Uh, I have great respect for the British royal family. Uh, I mean, they've they've run an empire rather successfully for the last thousand years. Uh, uh, my roots are, are English, Welsh, and Scottish, and you know they're they're a strong people. Uh, they're on a little island out there, and they've you know the Vikings used to come in there from Denmark, yep. and Norway, and they would attack a city and you know grab entire families and you know take them off, sell them into slavery, you know all that kind of stuff. I mean they've taken taken on people from uh, the continent of Europe and uh, won every time. And uh, hey, in 1940, uh, that was one. They were fighting the biggest mechanized army in the world, being the Germans, all by themselves until we came into play in 1941. So anyway, I, I have a lot of respect for England, uh, Great Britain, the United Kingdom. Uh, at some point, we're all going to pass away, and I guess a crown will be handed to someone. Maybe they'll give it to me, and I can be King Victor. I can go fight the Antichrist <laughs> tomorrow and conquer all the enemies. Yeah, that that was would that would that would be a, that would be quite the scene, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. Yeah. So, well, it, it, and speaking of fighting enemies, um, you know, and just the fourth quatrain of his book, uh, or. And it's a companion piece to yours. Um, um, you're talking about in, in the world there will be one monarch. Is that that somehow hinting at you know like new world order? You know one one king ruling well, the world. You know you have to kind of ask yourself. Uh, I know I don't rule the world. I don't own it and I don't run it. But who does really who, who does really run this world? Who who are the powers that that be that you know? Uh, it's probably no one we've elected. Well, probably, yeah. I, put it this way, I think you know it's like oh, in America, it's democracy, and you go out and vote, and this is your guy that represents you, and blah blah blah. And maybe when the Constitution was written, that was a story. I read somewhere Ben Franklin had in mind. It's like. Well, uh, we need someone to run the postal system. So we get the blacksmith down the street to not be a blacksmith for a year. He'll be the postal guy. And then we'll have these farmers over here be the militia. Kind of like you just saw common citizens playing roles in government and then being replaced by new people. But now our system, there must be so much money running things that it's kind of like politicians want to get in. They want to never leave. You know, they want to get that briefcase, $100 bills at the golf course or whatever to go represent, you know, some uh, some corporation or whatever. But right now, I mean, this, this globalization thing is, is kind of scary. I mean, it makes you wonder, who are these people who really run, you know, everything? And who, who does have all the billion dollars? And is there like a big, big oak table in some big building somewhere, the 500 richest people who run everything? I don't know, but uh, I'll just say that I think, in my opinion, they're kind of pushing their greed a little bit too excessively onto the people. I mean, we working bees, we can only take so much strain, you know. And in America, it's like uh, our economic system is upside down. It's like capital, the people with the money, they're rewarded. But guess what? It's the laborers who do all the work that really make the magic happen. Yet we, the workers, only get wages, but the capitalist makes more money than we do, but we're doing all the work. So in a way, labor is not rewarded to the degree that it should be, but the people who put make the investment, they get most of the, of the profit off of everything, and we, the little workers, get screwed, you know? But even the rich guys need someone at 7-Eleven to sell them the cigarettes and, and you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. So the rich are totally dependent upon us worker bees. But anyway, they need to share more with the workers to keep less for them. That's my opinion. What do you guys think? Yeah, the, I think you made some uh, great points. Yeah, pe people need um, you know, a – they are doing the work – 
Um, <laughs> I don't see why they shouldn't be compensated. Uh, uh, I I don't know how, how much, uh, uh, like what set seven dollars an hour is you know pretty low for minimum wage. Yeah, there you go. That's a good place to start. Yeah, what's going on right now in in Davos? You know, the World Economic Forum. That's the power players. I mean, you know, that's who's controlling it. Speak up, man. What are you gonna say? Yes, Mr. Pennington. Chris. Yes, Mark. You like you're gonna say you had something on your mind you didn't say. What were you gonna say? Yeah, I mean. We can't keep we can't keep building things up and they and we not get compensated for it. I mean, I've been thinking for the last couple of months. I'm tired of trading my time for money. I mean, and every, I mean, I wish I, why can't we come up with the next invention? Because I think things are already mapped out in the world. Who's gonna have the next invention? Who's gonna have this? I think things already foreseen for. Because I mean, I think hell, I think everything's already invented. The only thing we can do now is make something better <laughs> that's already invented. I mean, it's yeah. like. Yeah, and this 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 AI thing, whatever. I think Elon Musk is a great guy. I don't know all that much about him, but to me, it's like he he had something going a long time ago. He made a bunch of money, and it, you know we all know how hard it is to make money out there. So if you came up with a great idea and you made millions of dollars, that's great. I think the guy is is highly intelligent and really moving things in a good direction. So I'm very impressed with him. I don't know a lot about artificial intelligence. And that's one of those areas where, you know, it's so complex that you can easily be scared from it and go, oh, the machines are going to take over and the robots are going to come kill us all and all that. I don't know about that. But uh, these algorithms, I want to know more about algorithms. And you see it messing around on the computer on the Internet and how uh, you put in some topic and suddenly in your YouTube feed, you got all these related topics coming to you. So you've got a computer that's trying to outthink what you're thinking or, or think for you and anticipate what you want to see or what you want to do. And that kind of scares me in a way. That does kind of scare me. But uh, I don't know whether AI is going to bring us down or not. You know, it's just kind of one of those unknown topics that probably pe most people misunderstand. I think somebody is going to, I mean, I don't know, maybe somewhere. You're talking about AI, um, but I think somewhere in the fine print, it may say that your device is always listening. Like me and you are oh. having a general, me and you are yeah. having a general conversation talking about tires. I leave your house, I get in my car, and I'm scrolling and I'm seeing tires. Like okay, you were, listen what, you were listening to me here. I what mean, you said is exactly right. I have a friend who forever never had a cell phone. Okay, anyway, he broke down and got a cell phone. And he and I were having conversations about different bands. We were talking about Led Zeppelin, uh, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. And the guy said the next day when he turned on his phone, went to YouTube, all this Led Zeppelin songs here. Here's these songs by the Who, the songs by the Rolling Stones. It's like, it's like, yeah, that phone is listening. It is listening. And, you know, really it's against the law for them to be able to do that or to have a computer grab your data or your voice and figure out, you know, oh, we heard him talk about this, so we're going to send that to him to see if he bites the, takes the bait and runs with it. You're right. That scares the hell out of me. I don't want anybody hearing my conversations. I mean, you know it's, scary. I mean? it's scary, but there's two parts of the, the argument there. Like, why, you know, the, the um, Buffalo shooter, let's just say, you know, he, I'm sure he looked in the mirror, I'm going to kill these people. You know, because when you're going to do something, you're really pumped about doing something like, well, there's a basketball game. So you mean to tell me the phone couldn't, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, that's my oh, thing. You mean, if it's you mean you, if you're going to listen in, at least do it where you're protecting people and not trying to yeah. sell something? Yeah. I mean, yeah. not trying to sell me something. I mean, the man says he's in the mirror. Yeah. I'm going to kill a bunch of people. Got a rifle? Phone's like, yeah. oh. <laughs> the problem with that. Up. You would, if you admit that you have that technology, then you must announce what's going on out oh, there, there in go. Utah. You can't, you can't let everybody know what that, that data yeah, you center. Give up, give up the story then. That yeah, point. that data center in Utah that was put there because of the bountiful water supply, and that's why it was the most logical uh, location for it to go in Utah. You know, <laughs> I remember it's like man, back in the seventies or eighties or the sixties. You didn't hear about mass shootings. I remember as a kid, 
down in Austin, Texas, there was some guy who had a brain tumor, got up on top of a tower uh, at the University of Texas in Austin and shot like 20 people or whatever. Well, this year alone has been like 200 mass shootings. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, how much? I like to have fun. I like to have all sorts of fun. But uh, getting an automatic rifle and running around through an elementary school, shoot little kids in the head, is not my idea of having a good day. I used to work in education. And, you know, I thought if anyone comes into my school with a gun, instead of running the other way, I'm going to pick up a chair, a golf club. I'm going to rush that son of a bitch. And I'm going to tackle him in between putting in clips. I think we need to get some kind of awareness yeah, let teachers have guns, uh, you know, in their school. Or get the the, the 10, you know, most uh, buffed up uh, teachers in the school and make them the, uh, the squad to attack these people before the police show up. I mean, like in Israel, people run around with Uzis. They're ready for something to go down, you know. Well, schools, they need to be ready for something to go down, too. Like in my state. Uh, they send all these troops, uh, National Guard troops, to the southern border. They just sit around and do nothing. Well, say, you know, oh, we're trying to keep drugs out of the country or, you know, terrorists or whatever. Well, now things are so bad, they ought to get those National Guard troops and send two National Guardsmen to every school in the state with a gun, you know, on campus. And that'd be, uh, that'd be having things utilized more properly. But anyway, I don't get this mass shooting deal. I mean, how can you look in the mirror and go, hey, I'm going to go kill a bunch of people today and <laughs> probably shoot myself at the end of it? Well, that's just that's well, nonsense, man. That's crazy. Well, does that, do you think that that lends um, something to, like, you Nostra know, Thomas is saying, where he kind of hinted that things were going to start spiraling more and more out of control leading up to the birth of the third Antichrist? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, put it this way, I mean, Possibly, but uh, I mean, really, we've always lived in a world that's that's kind of crazy and screwed up. It looks like mm -hmm. it's just getting crazier and more screwed up as time goes on. You know, yeah, because they they show if you follow like some of the books that I have here. I don't know if you if you in your book if you've gone by dates or not. Um, a lot of these ones like to put like on this date in twenty thirty two. This is going to occur. Okay, um, here's the deal on that. Uh, in the astrological chapter of my book. Uh, he used maybe like 30 or 40 quadrains that had uh, astrological positions or called transits. When, when Mercury is in blah, 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 and Mars, blah, 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 he gives a position of the planets. There's something called an ephemeris that they use in astrology. You could look up those planetary positions and get dates for them, okay? No, so I have that in my chapters like, here's whenever this astrological uh transit occurs for the next 50 years between now and 2050 and you can get possible dates and in, in all the quatrains there's only like seven that use actual dates in 1999 uh was the last time he used the date and then we got the 3797 in the epistle so uh anyone who tries to tell you oh this is going to happen on that date and it doesn't have an astrological quatrain in it they're just kind of making that up but, uh, you know, he didn't really, like I say, there's only seven dates, so it's kind of up to us to figure out the time sequence. And yeah, it, the interesting point he makes is kind of him making an anti-statement in a way. He goes, people in the preface, like, people think, wow, it must be hard to predict the future. Wow, that's so complex. How can you do that? He goes, look at it this way for a minute. If, if telling the future is really just a matter of looking around at what's going on, and extrapolating what you're seeing forward into time, telling the future is not really all that difficult. Possibly. Yeah. See what yeah, I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, I don't so know. That, yeah, so you can see those days. I mean, so you do you lend anything into like the, the thought that we're right at the cusp of the third Antichrist being born? Oh, because uh, they have it like for 2035 is what they're. I well, I'd say I don't know. Next 10, 15, 20 years, you know, it could be could be alive right now, you know. We'll have to wait and see. But I think, like you were speaking earlier, uh, in Nostradamus' day in the 1500s or even in the 1700s or 1800s, Egypt was considered uh, the Orient or whatever, okay? Now we think of the Orient as perhaps China or as how we would think mm -hmm. of the Orient if 
we live here in the Western world. But anyway, uh, I think, you know, Russia and China and North Korea and Iran right now, from our point of view in the West, those are kind of the, the potential enemy states or whatever. And like I say, uh, boy, I'm all for our global peace. Hopefully they can, the whole world can live in peace. But if they fall short of that, which they probably will, you know, a war with China might be inevitable. Maybe, maybe we can avoid a war with Russia, you know, but uh, North Koreans, you talk about cuckoo. Those are the biggest cuckoo birds on the planet. As far as I can tell. Yeah. Uh, they scare me the most. I think the people in Russia are probably good people. They just have an idiot running the country. You know what I'm saying? And you find out, you know, we like to demonize other cultures occasionally, whatever. But really, when you dig down into it, most people are good people. You know, it's just maybe the leadership at the top are the idiots and the people down below are okay. So if we can get rid of idiot leaders and have replace them with good people in their country, maybe we can all get along a lot better. I don't know how the idiots end up taking power. <coughs> but that's what's going on in Russia. I think if they got rid of Putin, they could probably come up with a government that could get along with the rest of the world, you know? Yeah, North Korea is basically a cult. You know, and it's just in that's that's a crazy yeah, real evil cult at that. Yep. Thank, hey, thank God I was born in America. How about you? <laughs> thank you, God. We're blessed. And, and, and Victor, uh, you know, we, uh, we've been talking about AI, so, some of these contemporary uh, it, issues. It, and, you, you know, you cover in your book that um, uh, many of the dates of uh, you know, we're kind of like between 2000, 2050. Well, whenever I wrote my book, I started working on it in like 1992, I believe. So I thought, you know, especially using the ephemeris for the astrological quad train, just like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on uh, 1992 up to 2050. I thought that's kind of the lifespan of that might be my lifetime. You know, I probably will die in the, 2030s or something. But anyway, I just kind of use that as a time frame. So, uh, you know, people say, the world, I'll say this long story short, the world's not going to end anytime soon because, <clears throat> excuse me, there's hundreds of prophecies that haven't come true yet. You know what I'm saying? Well, so, so, some have. Yeah. So, anyway, long story short, there, there might be, you know, some nukes going off in the next 20 or 30 years. I hope not. Uh, at some point, one of the scariest prophecies in here was he talked about Nostradamus reference, uh, an event that will remove two thirds of the population of the earth. Okay. <clears throat> that hadn't happened yet. He said it will be, before that happens, there'll be some kind of pestilence. You can define pestilence maybe as disease or, or other things other than a disease. But anyway, some of this going to happen is going to wipe out two thirds of the world. And I, I figure, that's either going to be a massive, you know, uh, epidemic of some type or asteroid hitting or nuclear war. That, that's kind of the three main things. So we'll see what happens. So there's going to be scary stuff happening in the future. But I'd say right now, uh, boy, the next 10, 15 years is going to be the last golden era of, of our lives around the earth or whatever. The good old days are going to be the next 15 years. And then things are going to get really dark after that. I mean, it's just going to be, you know, it's kind of a scary world to live in. That's, that's the way I'm looking at it. I'm an optimist, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of scared about the future. Yeah. And that, no, that's, that's just it. It's just, it's one of those things you look at it and that's kind of where it lit up. Everybody's had that fascination with like what's coming. And it's just, it's one of those, we have a roadmap cut, you know, per se, but it's kind of like, you know, whether or not we we just say it is what it is, you know, we're just going to think or we actively try to make a change. You know, it's one of those things where I could see I could definitely see us being able to, in a way, affect some of the, you know, the inevitables. Yes. So what else is on your mind? No, it's, uh, like I said, I've. Pretty much the only thing we really didn't cover was uh, just like a lot of stuff is like his early years. 
Okay. That was, uh, that was about the only thing that we really haven't covered about, about him in the few minutes we have left here. Yes. Uh, Nostradamus was born like 11 years after Christopher Columbus. Uh, he lived in, in, in uh, Provence, which is the southern area of France. And in the 1500s during the Renaissance, that was sort of a cultural uh, mixing ground of different, uh, different philosophies and stuff. Um, you know, the church was pretty much Catholic church was pretty much in control of Europe at that time. And, uh, if you were into progressive thinking like, uh, astrology or alchemy or whatever, uh, you had to keep all that to yourself because the Spanish inquisition was going on. And if any, if you, anything that didn't scream Jesus, could get you in trouble, you know, people can yep. get burned at the stake. I mean, uh, 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 Ferdinand and Isabella, king and queen of Spain, they killed so many people. It's ridiculous. It was hardcore Catholic repression against society. So anyway, long story short, you kind of had to keep your personal mystical ideas to yourself, you know, but, uh, and they say another reason Nostradamus coded his, his, predictions a certain way is to uh to keep them like presented as poetry so the church could look at it and go oh man you're like uh some kind of a dark wizard here doing activities that the church doesn't like and being burned at the stake so that's another reason that he uh he he coded them the way he did but anyway uh he was he came from a jewish family and i think it was like 1485 it was a king charles of france passed a law where it's like, if you were Jewish, you had to uh, convert to Catholicism or you had to leave the, the country. So a lot of Jews openly converted to Christianity, yet secretly within their house, they still, you know, perform their own uh, personal mm -hmm. religious uh, activities or whatever. But he grew up in a very uh, interesting era of time. And uh, whenever uh, he predicted the death of his king, King, king Henry II, in, in a jousting tournament that kind of made him a rock star it made him popular you know throughout europe at that time and he's been uh, making you know he made his predictions we see him come true every so often so that's why we're still interested in him i think it's interesting you know it's like look at different points of view about different subjects and i think to take uh, the look at the point of view of somebody from long ago about what's going to happen in the future it's just as interesting or more interesting to talk to somebody today about what they think is going to happen in the future. So it's all the appreciation yeah. and respect for different points of view. Yeah, and, and Victor, you you were just talking about uh, you know progressive thinking. Yeah, you kind of got to keep that uh, you know behind closed doors. You know, at, at, yeah, yeah. Turn time. the phone off while you're doing it too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, but. Uh, you know, last week on uh, you know one of the reruns of uh, Ancient Aliens, uh, they did a, a recent show uh, uh, or uh, episode on Nostradamus where you know, they were hypothesizing about some kind of ET connection with him in okay. maximizing uh, the brain's potential. Uh, I've looked through the through the quad trains trying to. To see anything that could be related to aliens or UFOs and stuff like that, I didn't really find anything totally concrete. There might be a few references in there. There were. But, uh, I'll tell you. I, I think I kind of done some of my own metaphysical research. I can't really explain how I do it or what I do, but it revealed to me that there's basically 15 uh, varieties of aliens that come here. Okay. And kind of like God is the universal God everywhere. But every different planet kind of has its local gods or whatever. And the aliens, they know about the heaven or the other side, what God is or whatever. And uh, they are like our space brothers, our cousins from another planet. But uh, they are so far ahead of us. It's ridiculous. I mean, here we are, mm -hmm. a primitive li little planet. We can put little satellites out in space that go beyond our solar system and this and that. But if you you came from a planet that was 500,000 years ahead of ours, I mean, we're like little ants compared to them, you know? 
They don't have to ask permission. They don't have to get on the radio. Hey, we're going to fly into your town. Is that okay with you? They just do what they want to. I think they look at us as a little primitive culture of ants. You know, we're like little ants compared to them. Anyway, I don't think they mean any harm to us. But I'll tell you what's really weird. Three months ago, a friend of mine who lives about 200 yards away from me walked outside, looked up the air. He saw a, a UFO is in the shape of a Pentagon. Okay. And it had lights around the edge. The bottom was lit up white. It had like little hieroglyphics on the bottom of it. It would move around, take, take off. There's like a, a naval air base about a mile from where I live. And we didn't see any planes come around or anything, you know. But long story short, uh, I think they're trying to give us a message. Hey, people, you little ant people on your little primitive planet, you're about to blow each other up with all your nuclear weapons. You better get it together or you're just going to, you know, basically snuff yourselves out and destroy your planet. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a UFO about 20 years ago. I go bike riding. Went out in the country, turned off my car. I was about to get out of my car. I looked in front of me. I saw this white orb about 30 feet diameter hovering about 15 feet off the ground. And when I looked at it, it was like it read my mind. They can read your mind somehow. And it lifted up a little bit further, about 50 feet in the air. After about five seconds, it took off so fast. I've never seen anything move like that. It arced up and just I fought with my eyes till it disappeared. Of course, there is no retake. There is no rewind. You can't see it again. But now that there are cell phones, I mean, there are so many uh, UFO sightings uh, recorded, you know, on video and put on YouTube. It's ridiculous. I mean, they're out there everywhere. And most of the time, you're not going to see them. So I don't have the total explanation for that. But I think that the blues are the most common. And there's one type called the Swedes that, you know, kind of look like us. The Nordic ones. Yeah. 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 They work together. And I had a friend, I won't mention his name. He and his wife were driving from Houston to Dallas and they found themselves on a ship, you know, like an alien ship. The guy said, uh, the Swede guy was in charge. The blues were like his, his underlings or his helpers. And he, like your body can't move, but your mind can perceive. He said, one of the little blues pointed at him and asked the Swede, what about him? This guy's a really strong willed person. He heard the Swede say, Don't mess with him. He's too strong. Like, you know, this guy might punch me or this or that. Anyway, they they can read our minds like it's an open book. And hmm. they're so far ahead of us, you know, there's not much we can do about it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I wonder if it's like some of these big triangle craft. I wonder if it's like it's like a cruise, uh, like a, being on a cruise ship. And then they go from one planet to another. They go, okay, look down below. Here's a little primitive society. We're having a football game down here. Or here they are uh, doing this or that. Now let's go to another planet. Let's go to another planet. Who knows what's going on there? But uh, I've always been interested in UFOs, but I haven't really seen any direct references to that in Nostradamus's writing. Right. Uh, well, you know, with some of the um... – concepts you know uh, we've covered tonight um, uh, you know there is some uh, basis in science for uh, what Nostradamus has done uh, and, and you do uh, discuss his discovery of Neptune Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, I just wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah he did say. in the 1500s, uh, the planet Neptune, which he which he referenced uh, in one of his quatrains, was not even discovered yet. I think it was discovered in the 1850s by an English <laughs> astronomer. Um, yeah, I mean, see, like, once you dig down and do some research, you find some amazing things uh, in his stuff. Like I say, there's a, you know, there's a thousand quatrains and the epistle and a preface. So it takes a lot of time to go through stuff. And uh, it all depends on what you're, what you're looking for as you're going through and writing your own book about it. I was always interested, like I say, earthquakes, floods, mainly military stuff and the future of the United States and our allies. But anyway, yeah, there you go. Uh, he was an astronomer. So uh, he knew about the planets and uh, all planets, of course, are named after Roman and Greek gods. 
But anyway, yeah, there, there's there's a great point there. I'm going to write a letter to NASA and make that point aware of just to see yeah. what they have to say about it. I haven't done it yet. For people but for actual after- dates, um, Nostradamus died 1566. Yeah. And it was um, Neptune was discovered um, in a primitive telescope by Galileo in somewhere between 1612 and 1613. Okay. That might be your source. My source uh, uh, attributed to some guy. I think it was uh, well, put it this way. Galileo was after Nostradamus. Yeah. So whoever you want to look at, whoever. Yeah. So uh, it's like, so even if you just go by that, you're like, that was just a quick type in. Okay. I mean, even that you're still looking at right there 50 years later. There you go. That is So so uh, here you have somebody that's talking about something that isn't even known. You're a curious person with an inquisitive mind, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're, you know, curious about stuff. I would recommend uh, reading Nostradamus, you know, and, and just looking at what he has to say about stuff. I've been fascinated with it. And one other thing I want to point out is he explains how that, well, he's saying a prophecy, true prophecy has to emanate from God. Okay. He believed in God. True prophecy emanates from God. Uh, You know, if I say, hey, I think uh, this team's going to win this game tomorrow. Well, that's a human made prediction. That's not a prophecy. So the difference between a prediction and a prophecy is that predictions are man made and prophecy emanates. From God, just in case you wanted to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then yeah, I was like, just as you were doing that, I just look at the same thing. And then they, then they started talking about was it um, the Frenchman? I, th- I think it was say Urban um, Urbain Le Verrier or John oh, Catch Adams, yeah, Le- 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 or something. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. J- Jean Joseph Le Verrier. I think that was a friend. Le- Le- yeah. September 1846 is when mm-hmm. it was officially discovered. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I knew that makes sense. Yeah. And so you had the rudimentary one from Galileo that saw something. And then you actually had one that did all the calculations. It actually. And I'll tell you what. Uh, that's to, that's even. I was in Maui, Hawaii about 10 years ago, uh, staying at a rich friend of mine's house. And man, at night, when you're on an island out in the middle of the Pacific, you can see the stars. I mean, I saw the stars like I've never seen them before. And when you're somewhere where there's an absence of light, and you have no idea how much light is really coming from the sky. I mean, uh, you see like little patches of, it looks like gravel, just little uh, little, little groups of gravel, than, than bigger stars or whatever. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's like the universe is pulsing. There's all this light, different colors pulsing at you. I mean, it's it, pretty cool, so isn't much, it? Huh? It's cool, isn't it? Oh man, it's really it's... cool when you get out in the middle of nowhere and just look oh, yeah. up. It is like a theater. There's so much cool stuff to see. And like I was saying earlier, people forget that we are living on a ball of uh, molten iron and nickel. And we're on every day. We're on this little ride through space, through uncharted territory, going around the sun. At that same time, the universe is expanding. So Earth it sh- itself is like a spaceship. You know, we think the ground is solid. Mm-mm. It's just liquid underneath there, baby. We're just on the, the dried surface of it. And so we're all kind of like fleas on the tail of a dog that's running through the woods. We got to grab on for the ride, man, because it's a wild ride. Yeah, and Victor, with the uh, enthusiasm that you, you, you were just discussing, the yeah, uh, you know, might have been able to see the Milky Way, and you know this, uh, but you know more of the stars were much more visible to you. Um, it, it it seemed like uh, Nostradamus shared a similar type of wonder with his son about uh, the universe. Uh, uh, what was their relationship like? Uh, his son Cesar. Um, I don't really know a lot about it. I know that his son, after his, after Nostradamus died, he kind of tried to keep the legacy moving forward a little bit. Uh, but you know, sometimes look, look, look how different you are from your parents probably, or Mm -hmm. look how different your children are maybe from you. Every generation, things are a little bit different. So I know that Cesar, what uh, that was his son's name was an artist. But he didn't really, you know, follow the exact same path of his dad. I don't know exactly what happened to him. But, uh, yeah, he was not 
he did not really carry the torch of his father after his father passed away. So we got like, what, three or four minutes left. You guys so, make a profound statement to me or ask me a profound question here. Well, I was, I was just going to say, we're just wrapping it up. We got to get him to, yeah, we got to get him to get support here. It's like, for, I was just going to bring up the stuff but there. It's, I, myself, I mean, I, I hold a lot of, I hold a lot of stock just because I've studied it and stuff. I mean, it's just like you said, there's, there's certain things which have led me to believe that there was definitely, you know, definitely a gift, something behind his predictions, because there's, there's a, once you start having the validation of like, you're actually, you're actually doing these, you know, you can definitely look at these things. Okay. If he got these right, there's a really good chance that these other ones, you know, that he's going to either get close, you know, he's going to be close to the mark and, and that's one of those things when you start getting to where it's not just a generality, like I predict the death of this tree. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's going to die. I mean, it's like anybody can do make those kind of predictions, but it's just, it's the exact ones like locations, you know, like we just talked, talked about, you know, you, if you're able to predict something like a net, the location of Neptune, something that doesn't even, you know, for the rest of the world doesn't even exist. You know, that's pretty, that's something. And I said, and I think, and I look forward to one, you know, I apologize. I don't have it physically here to hold, you know, said, yeah. but it'll be here Friday. And I'll, I'm going to definitely read it because okay. like I said, I'll add it to. It's a good one. Yeah. I'm going to definitely add it to the collection. And for anybody else that wants, wants to pick that up, I'm going to also show you the picture here. So that way you can go to Amazon okay. right now, amazon.com real, real quick. It's, it's, like I said, I, I picked it up. It was out of print, so I, it, it was a used copy. So it was just one of those limited availability. So, yeah, I need to get. You can order my book through my website, Amazon. I need to get back in touch with them. They might have some used copies, but if you go to NostradamusUSA.com, you can order right a uh, a hardcover, or excuse me, a uh, a paper. Yeah, the, Look the, on the yellow, bookstore. The yellow <laughs> one is the ebook. The white one is the uh, paper book. So you can go yep. there and order, and you can order merchandise too. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's been interesting. Let's do this again at some point in the future. Oh yeah, cool. Oh, definitely. Uh, always know that we all have uh, certain gifts. Uh, each of us might have more talent than we're aware of. The world makes you want to think, doubt yourself, want to think you're limited in power. We've all got a lot more power than we think we have. So I want to encourage everybody out there. Use your natural gifts, explore new areas, and don't think of yourself as all constricted about doing stuff. Empower yourself and go out there and make a difference in the world the best that we can. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's I think that's an awesome, you know, message, you know, for people. And that's, that's kind of what I think, you know, hinted a little bit, you know, it's just for me, it's just, I feel like it's not so much as just like this dire prophecy, like you have no hope. It's also just one of those, it's like, Here's what I see coming. Doesn't mean it has to happen exactly like that. It's just, it's like, you know, this thing can't, you know, just because the Antichrist is going to show up doesn't mean that we all have to blindly follow. Oh, it doesn't mean that. Uh, and also, we'll, we're going to kick his ass too in every day show up. So, yeah. Yeah. So, it, for us. It, so definitely everybody go to the Nostradamus Society of America. That's NostradamusUSA.com and go there, get the, get the book, um, support me. You've got the gear. If anything, just, you know, sign up, you know, and just become one with, you know, one with society and help contribute, you know, and actually do, you know, there you, you can do, do that and help, help them there. Um, and as for us, like I said, just everybody just appreciate everybody's support. Um, you know, so, Victor, I mean, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. Appreciate right. it. It's been my pleasure. Let's do this again sometime, guys. Have a great one. Def definitely. Okay. All right, Thanks, all right everybody. Yep, this was brought to you by threebeardspodcast.com. We are still in the process of getting the sponsor. We, we, that's going to happen. But I just want to thank everybody for the um, every time you support us through stars, giving us giving us those that really helps the show, um, buying merchandise. Um, that really helps us. Ch check us out on all the social media. Um, helps really helps like YouTube, you know, if Facebook's doing something funny, just switch over to YouTube. It seems to be um, seems to go really well there as well just like and subscribe on there it's that really helps us we're twitter instagram tiktok we're on all all those uh check those out i think um if i'm not mistaken victor is on twitter i think i followed him um, with that uh i haven't haven't done that lately yeah. but i'm uh so he, ha yeah, he has a he has a he has a twitter profile we'll just go yeah, there. he does yeah. have a twitter profile 
So, and then, yeah, ch- check that, check that out. Um, and just go, like I said, three beards podcast.com. You can check us out with the merchandise there or go to redbubble.com three beards podcast. And that's how you can get merchandise from us. Patreon.com three beards podcast, you know, become a beardo. Just, um, just thanks again to Laura. She's our first Patreon. Appreciate that. And just, ERRT radio every Wednesday night at starting at 11 p.m. ish. Um, and we follow into the outer realms, uh, Joey and T- Tony Medea. So just check us out there every Wednesday night. Just appreciate everybody watching. Thanks again, Victor Baines, Bye-bye. for coming on the show. Go support him at NostradamusUSA.com. And Mark Eddy, before we go, I just I'm got to do a plug. He's got Nightlight show with Barbara. Um, what do you, who do you have coming up, sir? sir? Um, Kathleen Morton is next Wednesday night. So check, check them out. You can go on blogspot.com. Yeah. YouTube as well. Um, under Barbara, Barbara DeLong, DeLong, you know, you can go follow them and catch all their shows. They do everything and definitely check that out. Um, we have, uh, coming up, uh, Bigfoot and on, you know, Connor Flynn is going to be on the show with us there so we're going to be talking cryptids and bigfoot again so we're looking forward to that so everybody i said thanks again for checking out the show we will see you next week good night have a good one guys